Hey everybody, this is the Sliders Review. And since it's Women's History Month, I'm here today to talk to you about Fleabag Season 2. Now, it's been a good while since Fleabag Season 1, like about 371 days passed uh, from the first season. And so about a year has passed and a lot has really changed for Fleabag. In fact, some things have really turned around and other things have just kind of like, hmm, that's interesting. One of the things that turned around is her business. Her business is now booming. There are tons of people coming in and she no longer has to struggle and she no longer has to like steal. The bad news is that she hasn't seen her whole family in a full year. Claire will not speak to her and neither will her father. And so... What turns that all around is that her father and her godmother are about to get married. So they um, invite her to the wedding and stuff. This brings her um, interaction with Claire. Now, when it comes to the second season, like I said before, I'm not a huge fan of the second season. At first, I couldn't really figure out why exactly. I remember in the past when I watched this, I didn't like the loud music. And something just didn't feel right. Like something just didn't feel as funny as the first season. And something I've noted after rewatching this is that there's a couple of reasons now I know exactly why I'm not a huge, huge, huge fan of the second season. I like it. I just don't love it. And so the pro problem I'm having with this, you know how she breaks the fourth wall in the first season? Something that she never did in the play. In the first season, it was very subtle. And she did the very important like moments. In the second season, she kind of goes overboard with it. And she's constantly breaking the fourth wall. She don't really say nothing, but she's constantly turning to the camera and smiling or just like looking at people and stuff. And so it's constant in the second season, especially in the first couple of episodes. And it becomes a bit overbearing. Another reason why I don't like the second season. Well, I, I tell you about I don't love the second season. I like it. I just don't love it. The reason why I don't love the second season is because... In the first season, you know, each season, six episodes, there's a lot going on with Fleabag in the first season. There's her struggling business. There's her stealing. There's her love life. There's the conflict with her sister. There's the conflict with her godmother. The conflict with her father. There's the conflict with her sister, her um, brother-in-law. And, you know, and then also there's the entire boo thing. So there's so much going on that causes us to, like, really care and feel sympathetic for her. And it's so much drama and dramatic stuff. However, in the second season, a lot of stuff has turned around for her. She, her business is doing well. She's no longer sleeping around with random men. And in fact, she hasn't slept around in a very long time. She's not dating nobody. When she does start to interact with her family, they're actually getting along. Like her and her father are getting along very well. Her and her godmother are getting a well slightly, um, but the grandmother is still a little snarky. What is it? Claire. Claire is very rude to her in the beginning, but they actually start to bond halfway into the season. And so, and then when it comes to her love life, she actually does meet a guy that she actually starts to like. But then, you know, certain things happen and in the fifth episode, her life goes back to the way it kind of was in the first season a little bit. But for the most part, it really doesn't because there's only six episodes to this thing. And then when it comes to the stepbrother, or no brother-in-law, he's barely in this season. Like there's a huge conflict in the beginning, but I'll get to that a little bit later. And then there's the third reason why I don't love this season. Now, Fleabag is the central main character. She still is. Every episode that, um, has her in it and has her breaking the fourth wall. However, because Claire was a breakout star in the first season, they kind of infused a lot more Claire in this second season. In fact, to tell you the truth, because so much good stuff is happening in the Fleabag, in my opinion, it's not even really about her in the second season. It feels like it's more about Claire because Claire's life is extremely upside down and conflicted. And because there's so much drama going on with Claire and her marriage and other stuff, it's like, well, why didn't the show focus primarily on her 
in the second season. But of course it can't because Fleabag is the main star. And so it's like even though last season there was conflict and drama, all of that revolved around Fleabag in the first season. But then in the second season, we start to see a little bit, bits and pieces of drama here and there with Flea, but not much. But most of the drama, like I said, is involving Claire and stuff. She's having the dramatic breakdowns and this and that. And it's just kind of like in a six episode arc and the show's not even supposed to be about her. It's kind of irritating a little bit. Now, I do like the Claire actress. The character is a little bit gets on my nerves because of how the character is written. But I do love that actress a lot. And you know, it just reminds me of the whole mom situation. CBS had a show called Mom. I loved the first season. Second season is really good for the emotional stuff. After that, I tuned out. Why? Because in the second, okay, the first season, it revolves around an, a former alcoholic, drug addict, like mother. She has two kids and her mother's um, visits. And so it's a really funny show in the first season and everything revolves around the main character in the first season. By the second season, they realized that the um, out, uh, the Bonnie character, who is Cindy's mom, she became a breakout star in the first season. So the second season primarily focused on her. And to the point where even Cindy's dad came back into Bonnie's life, they rekindled, but then he died of a heart attack. And then we saw her spiral out of control back to drugs. Then somewhere in the second season to the third season, Cindy kids started to phase out of the shelter where they got written out completely. Then the daughter came back only to be written out again. And then by the third season and towards the end of the finale, I think it lasted about five seasons. They brought in like new characters. Recur the recurring characters became main characters. Now it's about Bonnie. Bonnie and Cindy's like two or three friends that are also women and former alcoholics and drug people and, and jailbirds and stuff and Bonnie's new boyfriend who's paraplegic. And I'm just like, what happened to this show? The, 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 the format has completely changed. And then Cindy, the actress on Ferris, she left in the last season. There's still no reason why she really left. It's speculation, but it's just hearsay, you know? And so that's how I kind of feel a little bit about Fleabag in the second season. Now I'm all for Claire getting some like character development and everything, but she kind of was a little bit more the main focus in the second season. And so with that, you know, those couple of things, it just caused me not to really like it as much. And then everything was less funny as opposed to the first season. And then that huge twist ending in the first season, there's no huge twist ending in the second. But on to the show. So when it starts off, we see Fleabag in the rest uh, restroom and she's all dolled up and her nose is kind of like bleeding and there's blood on her face and she's cleaning herself up and she looks down and then there's like a waitress and she's bloody in the face and she tries to hand the waitress like, you know, a towel and it's kind of like, whoa, what the world is going on here? Now the waitress, I'll have to relook this up. She might be the woman who plays Fleabag when they do the tours for the play. I'm not 100% sure or not. So then they recap and show what happened earlier. So, so the entire gang's at the restaurant and they're there to celebrate the engagement of like their dad and the godmother. So, oh. Fleabag hasn't seen none of them in like a whole year. And so they're all talking, they're kind of getting along. And then, you know, of course, Martin, he's there. Well, also there is this priest. And he's the one who's supposed to officiate the wedding and stuff. And so, like, while they're there, they talk and this and that. And some fourth wall breaking. And then at some point in time, when Claire and Fleabag are in the restaurant, not on the restroom, they find out why Claire won't drink any alcohol that night. Like she just refuses to drink alcohol. But before that, Martin spills the beans that, you know, him and Claire have been trying to get pregnant, but she's unable to. This upsets Fleabag. Every time she gets upset, she goes outside to smoke. So when she's with Claire in the restroom, she finds out, see Claire, something's wrong with Claire and she's in the stall. Fleabag barges in there and there's mess like everywhere. 
she had a miscarriage. See, she was pregnant the entire time and Martin does not know. And so Claire is really upset. She doesn't want nobody to know that she miscarried and she does not want to go to the hospital. But Fleabag is trying her best to get her to go to the hospital, but she just refuses. And it's constant back and forth between them two. But then she really, she doesn't go. And then so something happens when they're back with the rest of the family. And as they're talking, somehow something, something, something happened. I can't really remember what. So this is what happened when I watch way too many shows at once. And I'm trying to review more than one at one time. I forgot what the conversation, like, what was it about? But somehow the family started asking a bunch of questions and Fleabag just bursts out and she's all like, I'm the one who miscarriage. And so she decided she'll like take the like fall for like Claire. So Claire doesn't have to take it and everything. And so the family is actually really upset that Fleabag miscarried. Like they, they, they're emotionally distraught. And I'm like, wow, they actually really do care about her. Things must be really turning around for. Her. But then Martin, being disgusting that he is, he said, well, maybe the baby, you know, just didn't want to live. Maybe it didn't want to come into this world. Maybe it didn't want you as a mother. Maybe it just went and killed itself. And so everybody's just kind of like shocked by what he said. And rightfully so. And so Fleabag gets pissed and she punches him hard in the nose and he gets mad and he goes to like hit her back and i think he does hit her but then her hand swings back and then it hits like the waitress and that's how she got bloody nose and stuff and so like so that's how all the blood stuff happens so then when she's outside and she's smoking the, the priest dude starts to talk to her and the priest dude is like really quirky and stuff and she kind of likes him like that and she's starting to get like attracted to him plus he cusses like a lot for like a priest he's always throwing out f-bombs and he smokes and she's just kind of shocked because she's all like whoa a priest is smoking and cussing and all this other stuff so she's intrigued as she's heading back she sees claire with a taxi cab and claire's all like get in get in so then she wants to go home, but then Fleabag makes the driver go to like the hospital and they go. It is kind of interesting to see that not only is Fleabag like father is concerned about her and getting along with her, but Claire for the most part is now talking to her too since it's been like a whole year. Because you know, in the first season, they did not like her at all. And, you know, in this season, things are really turning around for her. And I just can't believe it. So when it comes to the priest dude, like I said before, he's very quirky. He's very odd and everything. And he's a man of God, but he loves throwing out F-bombs. He loves to drink. And he loves to smoke. <sighs> oh, sorry about that. It's late. I'm so tired. <laughs> oh, sorry about that, y'all. Anyway. So, yeah, he's this really oddball, like, priest and everything. And, of course, she's the oddball woman, so this is really intriguing her. Plus, she's been single for, like, a whole year, and she hasn't messed around. We've seen that she's gone to that male retreat, what they call women, like, sluts and everything like that. And she's really turning her life around and trying to figure things out, and she's still trying to be a feminist. Well, in a way, she starts to have, like, feelings for this priest dude. But she tells him, you know, like, she doesn't believe in God and this and that. And as she's sitting down in church, she's just in awe of all, like, the pictures that she see on the wall. They look very sexual to her and stuff. And when she breaks the fourth wall, she's like, Jesus. <laughs> like, the picture you will see, like, it's like a woman on her knees looking up at God as he's standing up or something like that. And it looks like that okay it looks like that so she's like jesus <laughs> and stuff so needless to say like even though she's not a religious person something happens to her she's starting to come around to religion to the point where she even starts to read like a bible and everything because she's getting very intrigued only because of this guy she likes so it's kind of like she's willing to 
not so much turn her life completely around and change her lifestyle for him, but kind of like see what things are about and probably change them just to like make him happy type thing, you know? Because she really wants a relationship and she doesn't want to like mess it up. One interesting thing about this priest is that he starts talking to her about like foxes. And I think about something about like a fox going to destroy something like destroy the world or something like that. And so she's just finding all this quirkiness, like really humorous. But then something bizarre happens that has never happened in the first season of Fleabag. As she's talking to him, she does the whole turn, look at the audience thing and breaks the fourth wall. And he's all like, why do you do that? And she's like, wait, what, what? He's all like, why do you keep turning your head and like winking? At like nothing and stuff and she's just like you saw that and he's like well yeah and she doesn't know what to make of this because like she's kind of like Deadpool in a way like Deadpool knows that he's a fictional character which is why he keeps turning to the audience and talking to them in the comic books or on screen and she's kind of like that same kind of way in a, in a sense you know and she can't believe it because in like this is all started to happen when Boo died. That's because that's the only thing I can think of. Because whenever we see a flashback with her and Boo, she never breaks the fourth wall. But then once Boo died, she started doing that. And so nobody has seen her do that since like ever. And so she's kind of like taken back from this. See what I think. And then also in this other episode, see, even before I saw this, like, even before I saw, like, the, what was it, like, third or fourth episode, I kind of started to think to myself, what if, what if the reason why she keeps turning to the audience is because she has no friends and she's like you know and like her audience is like the only people that she has you know because think about it in the first season everybody hates her the only person who likes her is henry but she doesn't like him back but she doesn't see him as a friend she just sees him as somebody she can mess around with but she does have feelings for him her father's not her friend anymore her sister's not um and the godmother and martin's not and so it's like she has absolutely nobody. Boo was like her only friend. And because of her actions, Boo is dead. And it's kind of like, you know, so she's looking for somebody to be friends with. And then she turns to the audience and sees them. And that's who she becomes friends with. And so now that she is slowly becoming friends with this priest dude, he is now taking that void of like the new friend. And it's kind of like almost like he's breaking into her uh, reality barrier of like looking into like the audience and stuff. And it's just a, a weird, interesting thing. Then when she goes to see like this um, shrink because see her father wanted to help her out and she thought he was giving her money. But no, he gave her like a free session to go to like a, a shrink and everything. And so while she's there with the shrink. She starts to get very irritated with the shrink because the shrink is starting to read her like a book and she doesn't like that at all. And then the shrink asks her, where are your friends at? And she and she's like, excuse me? And she's all like, well, don't you have any friends? Don't you have anybody to hang out with? She gets so irritated she's about to leave, but the counselor, you know, just keeps like digging into it. And then really like the only friend she had was Boo and she realizes that and she first she lies to like the counselor lady it's all like oh i have friends i have tons of friends they're always around me and then she turns to the um audience breaking the fourth wall and she winks so yeah she literally looks at the audience as like her friends and stuff and that's why she keeps like um breaking the fourth wall because she's so lonely she has nobody so she has like these imaginary people and stuff and so the priest dude is really starting to take that void of like being her friend. And so it's interesting that he's able to see her break the fourth wall. And one time it really pisses him off where he constantly keeps asking her, why do you do that? Why do you keep doing that? And he like screams at her and stuff. And then so after that happens, 
for a good while, we don't see her break the fourth wall no more. Like, from the third episode on to, like, or maybe the third, maybe fourth, on to, like, the, um, yeah, about third and fourth, we rarely see her break the fourth wall. I mean, we still do little bits and, uh, little bits and pieces here, but it is very vague. And so, like, it's almost like she's starting to become, like, a normal person now. And it's really intriguing because, like I said before, everything's going good for her. And, you know, now she's starting to have a friend. And now she's starting to have a almost boyfriend. But it's tricky because he's a priest and he's not supposed to date and do this and that. But then she started researching it online. Priests do actually have, like, relationships and stuff like that. But he doesn't want to go that far because he's such a man of God. And I think because he constantly cusses and drinks and smokes. He sees that he's kind of shifting away from that. And if he like has a relationship with a woman, it would really put him far away from God and stuff. So he resists it. Like he will resist her and stuff. Cause like when it comes to him and her, there was one time she was in the confession booth and she's literally just confessing there because she didn't tell him the truth about boo. She kind of like evaded that question, but then she finally tells him the truth. And she tells him that all she wants is to be told kind of like what to do and how to do it, what to wear, what to eat, what to this and that. And it's kind of weird because I thought you're a feminist. You're supposed to be all independent and stuff like that. And now has somebody tell you what to do, but whatever, she wants that. So then in the heat of the moment, he busts in and tells her to get on her knees. And yeah, they start like making out heavily. But then like a giant picture of God falls down. <laughs> and then he's kind of like, oh, that must be a sign. So he, So then they stop. And then, sadly, in the fifth episode, he tells her he can't do this. Like, he just can't do it. And he doesn't want to see her no more. He doesn't want her to come to the church anymore. And so it devastates her to the point where she's back to breaking the fourth wall again. And she's going back to her old habits and stuff. And her old habit is sleeping around. Now let's put a pen in that for now and get to some other stuff. Let's get to Claire. Because pretty much the whole season's about her. So Claire, she went to Finland. And when she went to Finland, she ended up like having feelings for another man. See, in this season, Claire is beyond wound up tight. Like when she micromanaged everything in the first season, in this one episode, it's even more apparent. And she's wound up so tight, like a violin string, and she's ready to pop. And so, what had happened was, Martin now wants to, like, sue Fleabag and for, like, physical assault and stuff like that. So, she needs, like, a lawyer. And, and um, Claire says she has a really great lawyer friend. But before then... Her and Claire, at some point in the, um, in the second season, they have an argument. And Claire, and then Fleabag's all like, your husband like tried to kiss me or something like that. And then she's like, I know, I know. And she's all like, wait a minute, you knew? Like, you knew for a whole year and then talked to me? And you knew that he tried to kiss me and all this other stuff? And she's all like, yes, yeah. she finally came to that realization. And when she was in Finland, she realized that she can have a better relationship. She can have a better husband. She can have a stepson who isn't creepy. I'll get a stepson a little bit later. And so, like, she started having feelings for this other man. And ironically, the other man who from Finland, his name is Claire. <laughs> but on to the lawyer dude. The lawyer dude was hilarious. The dude was like a major flirt. He always wants to, like, bang people. And he's a sloppy eater. Like, I couldn't even watch his face when he was eating. He had mayonnaise all around him. I'm like, ugh, man, it's nasty. <laughs> and so, some of the best dialogue this season came from, like, Claire and the lawyer dude. And Fleabag breaking the fourth wall. Because she couldn't tell if those two have, like, done it, want to do it, or something like that. So, as they're walking away, Claire, Claire is all like, don't you bang the lawyer guy and all this other stuff. She's like, I won't. She's like, I mean it. Don't you touch him. And it made it seem like Claire wanted him. This is before we found out Claire was going to leave Martin. So there was kind of like 
this weird thing. But then later on, towards the middle of the season, we found out Claire has does have feelings, and she does want the other Claire man, and she does not want Martin no more. But Martin really wants to keep her and stuff, and so Fleabag is excited for this. You know what I'm saying? Now let's kind of get into. Oh no, wait. Before I get into that, so back to Claire. So she has this like little award ceremony where she's supposed to award somebody this type of like woman award, like feminist type thing. Fleabag wasn't supposed to touch the award, but she does and it shatters. So she takes off running back to her godmother's place and steals that little um, statue of like the torso of like the naked person thing she stole from first season. And that was going to be the reward thing that she's going to give this person whoever wins it. And so when Claire is doing it, her speech, she gets all nervous and she decides to tell one of Fleabag's jokes. And so when she's talking to Fleabag, she's really upset and pissed at Fleabag again for some bizarre reason. And she's all like, you know, I'm a funny person, blah, 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 blah. And I can make my own jokes and I don't have to steal your jokes. But nobody told her to steal Fleabag jokes. She just did it anyway. When I say Fle Claire is so wound up and Claire is such a main focus. It's even to the point in the first episode, her family doesn't even know what her job is. They have no idea she's an accountant. They assume she was a lawyer. And she's like, no, I'm not a lawyer. I'm an accountant, but I work with lawyers and stuff. And it's to the point where Claire is just kind of like, she doesn't know. She knows what she wants, but she don't know how she's going to get it. And she kind of doesn't even really know what she really wants. And because it's irritating to her that people don't even know what she does for a living. And she's tired of her husband and she thinks everybody, she thinks she, she thinks she's kind of like a loser, kind of. That's not how people see her, even though she's this very successful woman. Now, one thing that's interesting, let's put a pin in that for now. One thing that's very interesting is that in, I think in the third or fourth episode after the love thing between the priest was, went wrong, there's a flashback of when the mom died. And so while they're there, I think Boo's alive at this time. So anyway, Claire and Fleabag. Fleabag is a hilarious part where Fleabag is like doing her hair and she's like, God, I can't believe this. I look so amazing. <laughs> and she's all like, I'm trying my best to look like hideous and everything, but I can't. And Claire's just kind of like, and everybody, and she's like, but you look like a hot mess and everything, like you're supposed to, but I can't, I just look great. And everybody who comes up to her is all like, you look amazing. And this is when the dad started to like not really talk to her that much because he just couldn't, because she's too much, she reminds him too much of the, um, his ex-wife. And so, well, it's kind of weird that like in the first season, Fleabag states that Claire got all the best body parts from their mom and she didn't get much. That don't make no sense in this episode because everybody keeps telling Fleabag how like great she looks and Claire just looks kind of like blah, you know? So that was kind of interesting. That we, and it was a long flashback too. It took up most of the episode. So Martin, like I said before, he barely shows up. He's only in like three episodes at the most and there's only six and they're brief when he's there and so one episode where he's there this is when things between claire and fleabag she started to realize that she had feelings for another dude so in a way Cla claire had to go somewhere i forget where and fleabag's all like because like her stepson plays the bassoon and so she had to get him the instrument and stuff and fleabag decides she's gonna do it well when the nephew sees Fleabag, he gives her a big, awkward, creepy kind of hug. And then, so, he whispers in Fleabag's ear, Tell my stepmom to leave my dad. And it's just kind of weird. It's kind of like, even the stepson wants his dad to like, be single and be away from Claire. But then we kind of find out why. See, we find out the stepson is very obsessed with Claire. In the first season, we only saw a glimpse of like his midsection and his private parts. Um, and when he's in underwear, like she's in the, the tub, he walks in and he gets in the tub with her. That was creepy enough. But then we find out he always wants to be around her. 
Like he's constantly asking where's Claire at? And then when he makes the song up, it's titled Where's Claire? So that's the only reason why he wants Claire to leave his dad so he can get with her. Weird. So back to the lawyer dude. When the whole love thing didn't happen between her and the priest, she goes back to like messing around and she messes around with the lawyer. And so like at one point, Martin decides he's going to show up and talk to Fleabag drunk because watch well, this actually, actually something happened before that. Let me get in that. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Claire calls up Fleabag when she's at work and tell you the truth, business is booming. There are tons of people there. Well, the bank dude who gave her a loan last season, he shows up, tells her he has a new job and this and that. Well, you know, when Claire calls, she's like, crap, I can't leave because too many people here. And he's like, oh, you know, I'll take care of your business and while you go and take care. He also gives her a hamster, which he thinks is a guinea pig. And so when she goes to meet <laughs> Claire, she wants to know what the crisis is. Claire cut her hair. Really, really, really awkward looking. And she's all like, I look like a pencil. <laughs> you have to watch that scene. So then, like, you know, they, um, she asked, well, what happened? She's like, I went to this one um, stylist dude. I think his name is Antonio or something like that. She's all like, what? I told you not to go to him because he messed me up. So they go there and Claire's not telling the truth whatsoever. She's there. She's all like, you messed me up. I want to look like this and blah, 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 blah. And so Fleabag is giving it to him. He's like, oh, no, you don't. Like, I'm going to show you the picture in which you wanted to look like. And the picture of the hair looks just like the one she has. So they leave because they're embarrassed now. And they don't understand. Fleabag is trying to understand what's going on with Claire. Claire confesses this and that. She's leaving Martin and stuff like that. And she's in love with the Claire man and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, stuff like that. Now back to Martin. So he shows up the cafeteria drunk. And he's talking to Fleabag. And it's a very creepy moment. And he's all like, is Claire going to leave me? and blah 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 stuff like that and so like he grabs Fleabag by the throat and I thought he was gonna hurt her but Fleabag plays it off as like comedy humor and stuff and then he tells Fleabag plain simple tell her don't leave me like please I need her in my life and Fleabag's all like I hope she leaves you by the night or something like that and so there's tension between him and her and let's, let's see what part no i am leaving out i think i'm pretty much covering everything let's get towards the wedding the last episode remember when i said claire had this event where she had to award this one lady Well, she awarded this one lady i forget what kind of award it probably some kind of feminist type thing so the woman is just kind of like oh it's a naked statue type thing so Fleabag chases the woman down because Claire is upset when the wap is the real statue and this and that. So Fleabag chases the woman down and when the woman, when she chases the lady down, the lady turns around and she's terrified. She's like, you stay back from me or I'll call the police because she thinks Fleabag is going to hurt her. She's like, no, 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 it's about the statue I can explain. So they end up in the bar and they have like a martini and, or some drinks. And so they're talking and they're talking. And the lady is, and they're just talking about being feminist and talking about pain and being a woman. One thing that kind of irritated me a little bit, well, not, not really, not really. Um, she said that women go through pain all the time and men only go through pain when they start things like war. That part pissed me off because it's kind of like, wow, really? We only feel like pain and sorrow when we start like wars and kill people? That pissed me off. But then the woman was explaining like how women go through pain all their life and through birth and uh, um and when their body changes and all this and that and i'm like okay yeah i can totally understand that a woman body is totally different than a man's especially when y'all have y'all periods and stuff so i totally understood that so then they started talking about like relationships and she asked fleabag are you a lesbian and i think fleabag says i'm like now nah, officially or something like that and then so the lady was talking about how she she's older now like 
she misses being flirted with. She like, you know, it's not a party unless somebody's flirting with you and people just don't flirt with her no more and this and that. And she really just like misses it. And this is the point that pisses me off. Fleabag then kisses her on the lips and the woman just pulls back. She's like, no, 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 I didn't mean it like that. And then so Fleabag just like stares at her for a little bit and then she slowly goes in and starts kissing her. And then the lady's all like, oh, I wish you was my type. But <laughs> totally rejects Fleabag and everything. And then I'm just like, wait, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Fleabag just kissed this woman twice without this woman's permission. The first time she did, the woman pulled back because she wasn't happy about it. And Fleabag did it a second time. Now, that's the same as that thing Martin did in the first season. And it was made to look like a predator type moment where Fleabag was disgusted and she felt like she was assaulted and stuff like that. But now in the second season, they're playing it off for laughs. That is such a double standard. I don't get what kind of message they are sending. Because in the first season, when Martin, he was just rambling off about stuff about like, I think they were both rambling off about like relationships and how he's irritating this and that. And then he just ups and straight up kisses her and stuff. And then, so now it's kind of like that same thing. And I'm just like, how is one supposed to be okay and the other one is not? And the other one, you, you're acting like you're a victim, but now you're acting like the predator and it's supposed to be all good because you're playing off as he, he, ha, 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 laughs. You know what I'm saying? And I just don't understand that. And so after Martin, like, almost hurts like Fleabag, she calls up the lawyer, dude, because she's, he's still suing her. And she needs to show that, look, Martin tried to hurt her. And not only that, but you're not supposed to have any contact. And he is contacting her and stuff. So she calls up the lawyer, dude. Plus, she just wants to bang. And so the priest shows up first. And so they talk. And he's a little upset. So they talk. And then the lawyer dude shows up. And then she doesn't want to answer the door. He's like, aren't you going to get that? She's like, nah. I don't like answering the door to strangers I don't know. And then so the lawyer dude's all like, I'm back. <laughs> so it's kind of like she answers the door. And they're talking pretty loud. And the priest dude realizes that. Him and her banged. <laughs> so then the lawyer dude leaves. And then I think the priest dude, he's not upset whatsoever. And so I can't recall if they kiss or not. But he does decide like to do the wedding again. And so now we get into like the wedding and stuff. It's an Asian themed wedding, which is bizarre because there's not a single Asian person at that wedding. And I know there are Asian people in London. <laughs> Just like there are black people in London. And there's only been like two black people at the most. No, three at the most on this series. And only the lawyer dude in the second season got the biggest role. Even the dude she sleeps with that was Boo Boyfriend, he shows up twice. And he doesn't say like a word. But anyways. So during like before the wedding even starts <sighs> Claire and Martin they kind of have like this huge fight type thing and Fleabag doesn't want to leave the room because she's just like enjoying the show and Claire basically tells him I'm leaving you like it's done and that's it and he's kind of like begging but she's like no and he just begs and then she gets on her hands and knees and she's like Leave me alone. I am leaving you. It like it took her this long to finally dump this dude. And it's like about freaking time, man. And so she really wants to be with the clear dude, but he's about to get on the plane. But she's at the wedding. So flea bats are like, ah, just leave, you know what I'm saying? Like be with this dude. So Claire ends up leaving and being with him. And so the godmother, she can't find the dad to marry. She thinks he left, so Fleabag's looking for him. And then he's up in the attic and his foot is stuck <laughs> on the floor. And so when she gets his foot free, they just talk and they're having a great moment and stuff. And it's like, once again, her life is turning back around. Claire's talking to her, her dad's talking to her. But then the godmother, they have some talks and discussions and 
she realizes about the statue being missing again. And she's all like, oh, you know, I'll return it back in its place. And she tells Fleabag that the inspiration, because she's the one who made the statue, the inspiration for the statue came from Fleabag's mother. That pisses her off. <laughs> <laughs> so those two get married and everything. And when Fleabag is at the bus stop, the priest dude shows up and he tells her, I'm sorry, like, I just can't do it. Now, he just can't be in a relationship with her. Now, what's interesting is that at two completely different times in this season, they both confess to the other person they fallen in love with each other. He told her that he's in love with her. And at one point, when she confesses to him, like, she really confesses that I truly believe it's the first time, probably since hair, because they got hair, she didn't really like him, but she kind of did, but she's never been like in love and love, and now she is in love with somebody, a priest of all things, and he just can't be with her. So it's a sad, but kind of like, it's, it's just like, it's closure in a way, you know, like, they both care for each other. They both they want to be with each other. They are probably the main friends, but they're both gonna go in their separate directions and stuff. And so as he's walking away, she sees a fox show up, and then she's all like, "Oh, you missed him," because he's always talking about the fox. And then it ends. It ends with her for the most part getting to have her happy ending. She didn't get her guy, but she got her family back. And she got her business back. And she got, and since the priest dude left, she got her friends back because she turns one last time and winks at the audience. And then as she's walking away, she turns back and she waves goodbye to the audience and everything. Now, one thing I said in my last review is that Joe was not in this series. He's in the play. Turns out, in the second season, they introduced Joe. But it's like a completely different Joe. He's a lot older. And him and her are just talking. He's rambling. He's kind of getting on her nerves. And it's a brief, very short scene. But needless to say, a Joe did show up. And so even though Fleabag was still the main central character of this show, it's like I said before, it was really more about Claire and Claire's discovery and Claire's acceptance and stuff and her trying to get away from Martin and trying to figure out what she wants in life. And I just thought that was a weird take because it's kind of like the show is not about her. It didn't make the show like terrible or nothing like that, but it's just because I do like the character of Claire. But most I like the actress. I like the actress a lot. Um, the character not so much, but the character's all right when she's being nice. But it was just a weird direction to go into and stuff. And it was also a weird direction to go into from Fleabag having nothing in one season, now having everything in this season and stuff. So, but it is also in the first season, it felt like it was more full. It felt like there was so much going on in six episodes, where in this one, it wasn't that much going on at all. But all in all, it was a good season. It just wasn't my favorite, you know? Happy Women's History Month, everybody. All right, I'll talk to you later. Bye.